Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Yael Hungerford, the Executive Director of the Adam Smith Society. As many of you know, the Adam Smith Society, a project of the Manhattan Institute, is a community that joins together to discuss and debate the contributions of the free market toward advancing human flourishing and opportunity for all. We are excited to be joining with all of you for this afternoon's discussion with Manhattan Institute adjunct fellow Stephen Myron to discuss con his contribution to the winter 2024 City Journal issue, How to Build American Better, which is based on a larger Manhattan Institute report, Brittle versus Robust Reindustrialization, just released last week. Before we get started, a few words about the format for today's call. In a moment, I will introduce Steve and then start off by posing to him some questions to help set the groundwork for the conversation. I will then turn things over to my co-host for today's call, our member, Daniel Newland. Daniel is a consultant with SEI, a boutique technology and business consulting firm based in Dallas. He's a 2016 graduate at the McCombs School of Business, where he first joined the Adam Smith Society. Prior to business school and relevant to today's conversation, Daniel served as an infantry officer and army ranger. Daniel will direct a few questions to Steve to dig a, big, dig a bit deeper into his arguments, after which point we will open up the floor to questions from all of you. Our Adam Smith Society Deputy Director, Lydia Bate, will be managing the question queue. At any point during the conversation, you can submit a question to Lydia via the chat function at the bottom of the screen. Please note we are recording the first part of this call, but the audience Q&A portion will be off the record and won't be recorded. One final reminder, if you're able, please have your camera on. It's nice to be able to see everyone's face. With that, let me introduce our guest. Stephen Myron is an adjunct fellow at the Manhattan Institute and works at the intersection of economic policy and investing. Previously, Steve was Senior Advisor for Economic Policy at the U.S. Department of Treasury, where he assisted with fiscal support to the economy during the pandemic recession. During his time with Treasury, he contributed to the implementation and evaluation of several CARES Act programs. Prior to Treasury, he was Portfolio, portfolio Manager at Savardin Capital and an economist at Fidelity Investments. Steve's academic work on fiscal policy has been published in the American Economic Journal and his opinion writing on fiscal, monetary, fiscal policy, monetary policy, and economics and markets has been published in the Wall Street Journal, Barron's, Bloomberg, National Review, and of course, City Journal. He received his PhD in economics from Harvard University, where he was a student of Marty Feldstein. He received a BA from Boston University, where he studied economics, philosophy, and mathematics. Welcome, Steve. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much for having me. It's a delight to be talking to you and to everyone else in the line. Your article makes the case for a robust reindustri reindustrialization plan that combines policy reforms to strengthen U.S. industry with a more traditional defense-related industrial policy. To start us off, can you say a few words about why we need an industrial policy at all? Isn't the free market best at allocating resources efficiently? Yeah, so markets, you know, usually are best at allocating uh, resources efficiently. Markets usually do, you know, uh, the best job possible. And in general, unless there's some special reason for not using markets, you should use markets. Now, the piece was written, you know, sort of, sort of from the point of view that, uh, you know, whether we need an industrial policy is sort of above the heads of economists because we might need it for things that are sort of prior to economics, right? Markets are great, but there are some things that are upstream of markets. You need institutions for markets to work. You need the rule of law. You need general peace and orderliness, right? You can't have, you know, markets will not be able to deliver efficient outcomes if, uh, you know, machine guns are raining fire down in the streets, right? And contracts are not enforced. Um, so there are, you know, institutions, law and order, peace are things that are sort of prior to markets, right? And things that, you know, within the world of economics, you might think, okay, markets do best, you don't need industrial policy. But then there are things that are sort of upstream of those. And one of those, of course, is national security, right? And so the piece of the the the, the piece, both the City Journal piece and the bigger, uh, you know, issue brief were both sort of written from the perspective of, uh, you know, sort of people in the defense world, people in the, you know, in the national security world are saying, okay, you know, we're falling behind in our ability to uh, keep on equal footing uh, or ahead of um, in terms of war material and ability to, to achieve our national security goals and protect our citizens at home and abroad. 
uh, falling behind in, in, in our competitions with Russia, China, various others. And so we need to have some sort of aggressive um, reindustrialization of the economy, uh, rebuilding of the industrial plants that we can build enough bullets and, and enough and enough uh, missiles and enough uh, sort of defense and, and, and offense equipment to, to keep people safe. So the piece was sort of written from the perspective of there's a national security need that comes that's prior to economics, right? That's sort of the you know meta economic, <laughs> if I if I can invent a word on the spot, um, and 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 say okay, you know if they've if they've told us that we need to do this stuff, uh, you know what what contributions can economists make to try and say what's the best way that we could do it that would that would best utilize and, mm -hmm. and harness the power of markets and create incentives that would that would make this as efficient as possible does have an industrial policy with the CHIPS Act, the Infrastructure and Jobs Act, and the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, it tries to uh, reindustrialize uh, manufacturing here in America. But you call this plan brittle. What do you mean by that? What I mean is that, uh, as you said before, you know, and, and as I just said a moment ago, markets are the best at delivering for the demands of consumers and firms. And it, industrial policy, no matter what no matter what it's aimed at, requires being able to pick winners and losers. Because if you wind up picking losers, uh, you know, the demand for that product will disappear once the subsidies disappear. And that's the very real danger that we're in with much of the Bidenomics uh, economic agenda, because, you know, especially with the Inflation Reduction Act, we're throwing, uh, you know, a trillion dollars of subsidies over the budget window. Um, at various, you know, clean energy products and green energy products and electric vehicles and climate climate focused products, uh, which consumers are happy to buy as long as there's massive subsidies, right? If there's if the government is paying you thousands and thousands of dollars to buy an electric car instead of a combustion car, you might buy the electric car. But you know, we can't afford that pace of subsidization forever. The budget would just explode. Uh, it would, it would, it would, it would bring the treasury market down because it would require such borrowing levels forever in in front of all the other budget problems that we have. That those subsidies are doomed eventually to run out, um, if they're not ended early for political purposes. And when those subsidies end out, are you still going to buy the electric car, which might be more expensive, which you know is has you know sort of spottier charging stations and charging ability? No, you might not. And so if we're throwing hundreds of billions of dollars, a trillion dollars at products, goods for which the end user demand isn't ultimately sustainable, isn't ultimately there at market prices without the subsidies, then there's a very real risk that the industrial plant that we're building just disappears when the subsidies disappear. And so it's sort of a temporary reindustrialization, right? It's a reindustrialization that's very vulnerable and that if and when we stop those heavy levels of subsidization, we may have some industry now that we built because of it, all this investment that's happening in, in non-residential construction because of the Inflation Reduction Act and the other programs, but it may all disappear very quickly uh, when the government dollars disappear. So instead, you advocate for a host of regulatory reforms that would strengthen American industry by making it less expensive to produce goods here. Of your recommendations, what are the three reforms you would most like to see that you think would be most impactful in terms of putting American industry on stronger footing? Yeah, so that question is sort of impossible to answer. <laughs> That's an impossible to answer question because there's so many. You know, the thing about regulations that makes them difficult to study and difficult to analyze and difficult to talk about is that there's just like, you know, hundreds of thousands of them. And they're just so, you know, and 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 hundreds of thousands of pages of of text in the the Code of Federal Regulations and in the Federal Register describing how all these are implemented. Uh, and then, you know, millions of pages of 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 additional process and FA, you know, uh, um, FAQs and 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 final rules and uh, you know, and, and court, uh, you know, sort of court processes and history of, of litigation of how these things get implemented and decided. And they're very heterogeneous and they affect things in very different ways and they're very specialized. And, you know, you wind up having law firms that specialize in this type of regulation, that type of regulation, and because they're so heterogeneous, it's it's very, very, very difficult to study from an economic perspective. And economists have a very difficult time with it. It's very straightforward to study taxes, right? You know, like, oh, 37 percent tax rate. What does that do to the person who's paying the tax? You know, like it's it, it's pretty straightforward. But when you sort of talk about regulations, there's so many of them and they're so different that it's hard. It, it makes it hard to study and it makes the economic estimates of their effects very difficult to interpret as well. But if you press me, I'd focus on the environmental stuff, right? And, and I'd say first and foremost, 
you should be looking at regulations that are going to get the price of energy down, right? Because energy permeates the economy in a way that nothing else does, right? It permeates the production of goods because you require energy to engage in foundries, right? You need require energy to engage in industrial plant, whether you're, you know, whether you're just, you know, doing something as simple as sewing textiles, right? It's a machine powered by energy that's doing it or doing something complex like creating very specialized, uh, you know, materials that go into very specialized weapons and, and, and defense stuff or whatever the goal of, you know, whatever the industrial purpose is, it requires a ton of energy to do it. But it's also permeates the entire economy through the service sector as well, right? Most people in this country are driving to work every day. You know, it's, you know, in Manhattan, you know, we have subways and it's great. You know, we take the subway to work, but most people in this country are still driving to work. And so even the cost of the, so the cost of energy is going to wind up permeating the surface sector as well, because you need energy to get the labor to where it to where it's going to be. And so energy prices just permeate the economy deeply in a way that nothing else does. And so our goal should be First, to avoid trying to make energy, uh, you know, sort of various forms of energy more expensive uh, to pursue what, in my opinion, are climate goals that we are not going to achieve because they don't address what's going on in, in Asia, specifically in China. Um, it, you know, it, as long as China keeps on throwing out more coal and more emissions every single year, uh, the reductions in emissions in the U.S. wind up getting very quickly offset by increases in emissions abroad and so we wind up having no net effect on the climate so we're sort of taking huge economic pain for minimal climate gain it seems completely uh misguided to me um so first of all we should stop trying to make energy more expensive for the sake of reducing for the sake of reducing emissions because the climate gain that you get from reductions in emissions here is basically negligible on a global scale um and then second we should go out of our way to make it cheaper to produce energy of all types right uh, you know, and that includes traditional fossil energy. That means make it easier to prospect, make it easier to drill, make it easier to get it to to get it out of the ground. And then I think also, you know, on the environmental front, you know, we we, we need very very serious uh, and aggressive reform of the permitting system in this country, right? Of the of the fact that the EPA, you know, sort of. Uh, you know, sort of will will make it very very difficult to build a new factory in many in most places in the country. Uh, the NEPA system is completely is is completely uh, broken and need a very deep reform. Um, the you know environmental reviews, environmental assessments for various parts in the chain make it very you know will delay the 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 need to, sorry delay the ability to build industrial plants by many years uh, in the case of a lot of pro a lot of projects, and it needs you know it, it needs aggressive aggressive reform. But you know the fact that regulations are so as I was saying before, so heterogeneous and so diverse and so specific to whatever activity you're taking, whether it's building homes or building semiconductors, makes it difficult to sort of identify a, you know, like a magic bullet, right? There's not, you know, like I said before, like with taxes, you know, oh, you focus on, you focus on the marginal rate, right? And, you know, sort of the, you know, and yes, there's more subtleties than that. You can talk about tax expenditures and, you know, and, and, and progressivity and, you know, sort of what you're taxing and so forth. But in general, it's pretty straightforward, whereas regulations are so complex and so diverse that there's no, you know, sort of one or two or three magic bullet that you could say change that and it's going to, it's going to fix the system. It, it requires an approach that I think is even more aggressive than what the Trump administration took uh, in President Trump's, you know, in from 2016 to 2020, in the the one out, the, sorry, the one in two out rule, where for every new regulation, uh, the government was President Trump required the government to eliminate two old regulations, so that there would be a net negative one, uh, you know, addition of regulations for everyone. I think you need to get even more aggressive than that. You need to go like, you know, one in three out or one in mm -hmm. one in five out or something. Uh, yeah. You also speak a lot about the need for workforce reform um, and education. Do you want to say something about, especially with unions, um, what you'd like to see done there? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, I think one problem, one significant problem that we have uh, that makes, you know, the the reindustrialization agenda of the of the Biden administration so brittle is because it goes out of its way to drive labor costs to drive labor costs up 
right? And so there are all sorts of rules written into the Bidenomics agenda, whether they're actually outright legislatively um, or or just in terms of implementation, in terms of, you know, the agencies have have discretion in terms of how they implement it, uh, how they implement the law um, that go out of their way to, to drive labor costs higher. Right. And so these are things like requiring, uh, you know, sort of non-union firms to pay union wages and sort of things encoded in the, the, the Davis-Bacon Act. Right. Uh, these are things like, you know, requiring firms to provide health care uh, for for their workers, not only the, you know, so the CHIPS Act, right, requires, uh, com you know, semiconductor companies that accept funding from the CHIPS Act to require to provide uh, health care to the government standards for workers as part of the employment contract, but not only for the actual, you know, sort of semiconductor employees that are the actual target of the CHIPS Act, but also for the construction groups, right? So, you know, if in, in the cleaning staff and everyone else, right? And all this serves to raise the cost of labor, make it more expensive to use American workers than to use workers abroad by investing abroad. And that makes what I consider to be a very brittle form of industrialization because we're basically driving up the cost of production on purpose. Right. And if you're driving up the cost of production on purpose, like I said before, it's fine if the government's paying you to do that as a business person, you're going to say, OK, it's, you know, stupid, expensive to produce here because they're, you know, I have to provide health care for all these workers. You know, if somebody's coming in to clean once a week, I have to provide health care. Sorry, I have to provide child care, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, or I have to go out of my way to to encourage unionization of the workforce, or I have to go out of my way to hire a workforce that has certain biological characteristics that the government wants me to hire. Uh, and all that drives up the cost of business, drives up the cost of production. And I might say as a business person, that's fine if the government is paying me millions of dollars to do it. They're giving me this huge subsidy from the CHIPS Act, right? But if the subsidies disappear if the subsidies don't wind up being repeated, if the subsidies are a one-off uh, and not in perpetuity, then when the subsidies disappear, it means that I'm uncompetitive and I'm not going to be able to compete with production in China, production in Taiwan, production in South America, in Mexico, in, in, in India and anywhere else. And so when the subsidies disappear, I think that we are just we're just setting ourselves up for for a repeat of the of the deindustrialization that's that sort of swept the country from you know the the seventies until really uh, you know sort of the beginning the middle of the twenty tens. Let's turn to the defense sector, where you argue for more traditional industrial policy consisting of by American requirements, tariffs, and increased investments in R and D. Yeah. I'd like to push you on your contention that shoring up production is in our national security interest. For reasons of self-interest, aren't nations whose economies are mutually intertwined and dependent less likely to go to war with one another? By contrast, might tariffs and other measures you recommend be seen as an act of aggression? Yeah, so that's 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 a great question. And so um, what I'd say is, um, sorry, I seem to have lost the, there we go, sorry, one second Zoom problem. Um, so, I, I turn to industrial policy for the defense sector because, as I was saying before, I think it's the place where you're on the strongest economic grounds for having an industrial policy at all, right? National security, you know, peace, you know, the existence of institutions, like I was saying before, are sort of prior to markets. They're they're upstream of economics. You can't have markets if you have bombs raining in the street and you know you're you're an occupied country or whatever, right? And you have to pay tribute to Rome or whoever. Um, so therefore, um, industrial policy is appropriate, I think, in the defense sector. Um, and it's a much, much, much harder leap to make to argue that it would be appropriate in other sectors of the economy, as the Bidenomics agenda is doing with, you know, sort of the climate stuff and 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 actually in, in many parts of the economy. Um I'm not a political scientist. Um, I think that there are people who really study um, the effect of, you know, trade on on war. Um, from my casual observation, you know, and, and I'm, I'm happy to, to I'm happy to hear if there's any if there's any people on the line who, who study this. I'm happy to hear this, that this is wrong. But, you know, I, I don't know that I think that increased trade really decreases, you know, with all due respect to, to, to Adam Smith, I don't know that I think that increased trade reduces the risk of war. I mean, if you think about World War One, you know, the 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 world was at a, a localized, you know, global globalization 
local max, right? Local peak when World War One happened. And, you know, on the eve of World War One, you know, there's this famous quote that, you know, sort of Keynes was was writing about all the things that you could get in London uh, before you leave your bed about, you know, sort of the tea from China and the, you know, the silver from Germany and wherever, and you, you're writing letters to people in Paris and, you know, sort of globalization was sort of in full steam ahead. And that didn't stop the the breakout, the breakout of war. Um, and, uh, you know, if you think about the opposite side, like the Cold War, where we had zero war, what's, you know, sort of, you know, very minimal trade beyond the iron, beyond the iron curtain, you know, the Cold War by and large remains cold and not hot, right? So, um, maybe maybe it's the case that Adam Smith is right, but I I don't I don't know that 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 he was. Um, and in fact, you know, if anything, you know, I think that the progress we've made in game in the game theory of this stuff has been super impressive, right? And you know, I'm a believer that deterrence matters, right? And that the best way of avoiding war is to just be so so scary that people are terrified of 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 looking at you the wrong way because they're terrified you'll blast their heads off if, if you do. Um, so you know, I, I think that. That, that deterrence, you know, so I think the game theory basically teaches us that that deterrence is the best means of maintaining peace. And so the the if, if people are so scared to go to war with you, um, I think, it, you know, I think that's the best effective thing. And I think that if you look at, you know, if you look at the history of, uh, you know, say, uh, you know, the Iranian, you know, centrifuges, right? Like, when did they ever really stop, right? It was right after the U.S. invaded Iraq because they were terrified that they would be next, right? And when that when they were scared of that threat was the only time that that they ever really stopped enriching uranium uh, in the course of the last you know forty you know forty years type of thing. Um, so you know it, it, that might be right, and I'm I'm very happy to hear from any people who study this that you know globalization really does prevent war, uh, but uh, yeah, I'm 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 not sure I believe it. Yeah. One last question before we turn to Daniel. Let's Please. um let's drill down into your argument for more government funding of defense R and D, um, as it seems to go against Hayekian insights into the strength of the decentralized marketplace. Yeah. A timely relevant example is the rise of NVIDIA as a leading chip firm, a transformation due to the emergence of AI that few predicted. In contrast, China has invested billions of dollars into chip making without much to show for it. My question for you is, why is U.S. military bureaucracy better equipped than the marketplace to promote the development of te defense technology? Yeah, so again, you know, I, I, I just draw a distinction between defense stuff and non and defense stuff and and everything else in the economy and i think that you know what you said about you know uh, about hayek's insights and and the fact that it's very difficult to uh to predict what's going to happen are are 100 percent my view about how the about how the economy works and policy should be um in the the vast bulk of the economy right but i do think defense is a little bit different um in a couple senses um one, the major challenge with industrial policy is picking winners and losers, right? Um, I do think that the that will be better at picking government will be better at picking winners for military purposes than for non-military purposes, for the reason that in non-military purposes, what the government is trying to do is to pick consumer winners and losers, and government bureaucrats and politicians, you know, have a, you know exhibited no specific no no great skill at knowing what consumers are going to want, uh, you know, 10 years, 20 years down the road, right? By contrast, the military, you know, engages in fighting itself, right? It And so it, it knows, you know, what killed its, what killed its soldiers and what it took, to, what it took to keep them alive, what it took to, to win a battle, what the, you know, what tools the enemy is, is innovating on, what it'll take to counter them. And so I think the military is going to be a little bit better at predicting its own demand for products in the next five years then government bureaucrats will be predicting consumer demand in the next five years, right? Politicians have a hard time predicting what voters want, right? They also have a hard time predicting what consumers want. And I think that the military is probably a little bit better at predicting its own needs than the other stuff. The other thing I'd say is that, you know, I'm a really big believer in in learning by doing. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, you know, sort of militaries out there fighting. Right. Um, you know, private sector folks aren't, you know, like, you know, I guess we we do have, you know, some black waters of the world and stuff like that. Um, but by and large, you know, businesses and out there, you know, sort of really, really learning by doing itself. Um, 
so but but frankly i don't see why why we can't use why we can't use both uh you know and and i do believe in markets and i and i do believe in 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 the, the ability of the private sector to 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 you know create unexpected things which wind up being you know enormously changing the world uh for the better technologically and, and in many senses um and if you look at the history of the cold war you know there were these huge public private you know partnerships corporate labs right which really fostered uh you know a lot of the innovations that came out of this defense driven industrial policy like the internet like radar right like stuff like that um and and created you know sort of market uses for them uh for these innovations that nobody expected was were going to happen as well as defense innovations for these technologies that nobody expected was was going to happen great um let's bring daniel newland on the screen and he can take over sure thank you yale steve uh good to meet you thank you for joining us so thank uh, you uh, you mentioned uh, the the Trump administration's one in two out policy earlier, and um, in your article you specifically mentioned repealing the Davis Bacon Act, which uh, drives up the cost of federal construction projects. Um, that was passed in the, the 30s. So my question to you is, why do you believe that it has lasted this long? And sub question: How did it survive the Trump presidency? Yeah. So, um, so the Davis Bacon Act, uh, basically, um, you know, as as Daniel said, it's it's from the it's from the New Deal era, and it was designed to prevent, um, it was designed to prevent, you know, sort of out of the area, non local um, competitors from swooping into some area where there was a government program. You know, there was a Public Works Administration Act, and you know, you're going to build a dam or you're going to build a bridge, right? Uh, funded by the federal government in the Great Depression, and it was to prevent, you know, people from out of state, out of the area, from coming in with their own workers from a cheaper part of the country and uh, swooping in and taking the public money and building the project there and having no effect on the improvement of the local economy, right? Um, that's sort of what it was designed to do. Uh, the way it did, the way it tried to accomplish that, that's what it was intended to do. The way it, it sought to accomplish that was by instituting what are called prevailed, prevailing wages requirements, right? And so the law states that uh, if you're taking money from the federal government for a project, you're a contractor, uh, you're a builder, whoever, um, and you're going to build your bridge or your dam or your semiconductor foundry or whatever, um, you have to pay prevailing wages for the activity that you're paying, right? So that means that the Labor Department uh, goes and looks at what what goes and calculates um, average wages in the area for the type of activity. Mason Ray in the Tuscaloosa, T Tuscaloosa metropolitan area mm, gets paid $18 an hour, you know, plus benefits. And so anybody uh, paying for Mason Ray in that area has to pay $18 for, for that, right? Now, that's, that's how the law, that's what the law does in practice. Uh, what it, in practice, what it does is it basically makes unions wage setters uh, because if unions are basically uh, setting are are the modal price setter for um, for an activity like that for masonry in that region, um, basically nobody else can compete to to pay less than the union is paying, um, and and because that would be paying below the prevailing wages. So it prevents you from competing on labor costs. It prevents you from cheapening the cost of the project, and it empowers unions because nobody can compete with them because it now becomes illegal uh, to compete with them if you're taking the government money. And so what that does is it enormously drives up the cost of doing a project because you just, you know, you, 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 you're you forbidden from cutting your costs on, on labor, right? Um, and so that, that's a New Deal era policy that's sort of still with us and, and still, uh, you know, sort of still very much affecting the way the industrial policy of the Biden administration is, is operating. Um, the Trump administration didn't repeal it because it, you know, you need you would need a filibuster proof majority in the Senate to do so. Uh and you know, we we haven't had 60 senators on on you know sort of one side of the of the aisle since uh, the Affordable Care Act. Um so you know, so if we had you know 60 Republican senators, uh I'm pretty confident we would, you know, just get rid of the Davis Bacon Act. Um, unfortunately, that was that that's not within uh, within power in a, in a in a Senate that operates under the rules of the filibuster, um, and you can't achieve closure. Um, there are ways to weaken 
So, so, so let me say this without the ability to repeal it altogether, what you can do is fix the way DOL calculates prevailing wages, because of course, DOL, um, you know, under current political leadership is incentivized to calculate the highest prevailing wages it possibly can. Right. And what you learn with, with government implementation of policy is there's all sorts of, I'm sorry. There's all sorts of methodological choices that get made um, that get made on the way from conceiving conceiving a statistic that you want to um, to arriving at the statistic that you want. And so DOL under current political leadership is incentivized to calculate the highest possible prevailing wages it can to try and boost the wages being paid for being received in in these projects. And, you know, that's great. We all want high wages for workers, but it does raise the cost of doing business and it does make you less competitive. Um, and it's not the, it's not, you know, raising wages by fiat is not the way to sustainably boost wages for workers. If you want to do that, you need productivity growth, which means you need efficient investments and you need labor demand and artificially holding back supply is not, is not the, is not the way to, is not the way to achieve that. The other way that you can weaken uh, the negative effects that Davis Bacon has in the economy is that the president has the authority to waive prevailing wages requirements uh, in a in an emergency, right? And so, uh, you know, Nixon, uh, you know, sort of was the first one I think to sort of really invoke this during the '70s inflation when he was trying to bring inflation down, and so he, you know, declared inflation a national national emergency and started waiving prevailing wages requirements on, on federally subsidized projects. Um, it's been used regularly by presidents since in national, national disasters, uh, you know, uh, both Clinton and Bush, uh, both Bushes, uh, in the aftermath of any hurricane, when you want to rebuild quickly and quickly and cheaply and affordably and as best as you can, you waive the prevailing wages requirements. Um, and so, you know, you, you can do that. Uh, it does require the president to declare an emergency. You know, there are questions whether you want to abuse that emergency power because, you know, I don't love I don't love abusing emergency powers, even when even when it, it's still a net, a net good. Um, but, you know, yeah, it's it's uh, it's problematic. Understood. Thank you. Um, so back to China, you mentioned them specifically as a national security threat and proposed um, raising tariffs until certain economic and geopolitical requirements are met. Uh, what changes would you like to see China make in order to satisfy those? Yeah, sure. So I don't expect them, I wouldn't expect them to agree to anybody's lists of demands. Uh, you know, so China, um, you know, has its own politics and its own political requirements that prevent them from accepting anybody else's lists of demands. But uh, you know, I still think it's important to give people a chance, um, uh, even if you don't think that they're going to take it. So I think that you could divide things into two buckets, right? You could divide things into the international security bucket, and you could divide things into the economics bucket, right? The national security stuff is pretty straightforward. That's, you know, sort of stop supporting military confrontations that are really, you know, sort of <laughs> burning, you know, sort of, you know, fracturing, uh, you know, the geopolitical environments that delivers peace that allows markets to markets to flourish right so there's all sorts of bad actors around the world uh from iran with its death to america marches uh to uh you know uh hamas in israel to russia and ukraine uh russia in in the ukraine that um you know sort of china sponsors and china supports and china encourages in order to try and uh, weaken uh, the American uh, influence on the planet, and they don't really care how many people die in the process of that. Uh, if they're, you know, if they can start a war between, uh, you know, uh, Bolivia and uh, sorry, between Venezuela and Guyana over uh, over claims to oil fields, uh, you know, they're happy to do so because they, they don't care how many people die. They're happy to do so because it it, it makes America look weaker and American security guarantees uh, look more in question. Uh, so, you know, stop violating other people's, you know, exclusive economic zones, stop violating their air defense zones, stop sending your your fisher boats uh, in, in depopulating the fish in international in, in both in international waters, as well as in other people's actual exclusive economic waters, because they don't have the technological ability to to to, to keep you out or to detect you. Um, so the national security stuff is, is is pretty straightforward. The economic stuff is also, you know, is a, is a different bucket. But again, you know, like I don't think that we owe uh, 
opening our markets to people who abuse the system of international trade, right? That means reciprocality, right? I'm very happy to have open markets in the US and to open our markets to China if they were to actually reciprocate and open their markets to American goods and services. And they just do not do that uh, whatsoever. Stop stealing intellectual property, right? Just stop it. Uh, pay reparations for the for the intellectual property that you already stole, right? Uh, you know, uh, make 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 amends and state subsidies, right? And end your subsidization of 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 various sectors uh, for the sake of trying to dominate uh, markets and 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 boost your export growth. Ditch the Made in China twenty twenty five plan, right? There's all sorts of stuff uh, that you know, sort of interventions in the economy that China undertakes that wind up massively warping the global economy and the American economy simply because China is so big. Um, you know, if you want to, you know, and, and, I, and I think that you can sort of build this, you can build this list out like, a, you know, it's just act like a normal country. Um, don't act like you're trying to, to destroy the world order uh, or destroy America. Um, Got it. Thank you. So um, back to uh, using the, the military or defense as a, as a vehicle for enacting some, some changes here. Um, one could make the argument that there's a lot of disruption already happening in defense tech. There's been a threefold increase in VC money over the last um, over the last four years, about 125 billion compared to 43 billion uh, prior to that. Um, what a so when it comes to like military procurement, in addition to in addition to adjusting sourcing requirements, what suggestions do you have for simplifying the acquisitions process? Yeah. So. Um... So that's that's a tough question, um, and I feel like people spend their entire career studying uh, the defense acquisition process, and I'm I'm not one of those people. Um, I'm I'm just an economist. Uh, I, I'll I'll tell you that I I do think it's important to uh, have a clear focus on the types of weapons and and, and defense that we need to fight uh, in the enemies we have in 2024, as opposed to the enemies that we have that we had in 1995. Um, and I, you know, the, the, the nature of war has changed. And I, I think the, the military industrial complex has been a little bit slow to, to adapt to that. You know, we still don't have hypersonic missiles, uh, you know, um, so, you know, I, I do think that there needs to be reform. Um, and I would be happy to defer to the people who are experts on that, that know about it. Uh, cause like I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just an economist, but I actually let me turn this back around on you and uh, ask you and ask you to answer the question because I guarantee you, you know you know you know a lot more about that about that question than I do. Uh, so your answer will be way better than mine. Sure. Um, I, I would never claim to be an expert, but I know a little bit. Um, I think there should be a lot more investment in in defense tech. You have some, you know, VC firms and, and other organizations like Y Combinator put out requests for startups. There's a fam uh, well known article a couple of weeks ago. I think the DOD should be doing the same thing. They are already, but they kind of do it quietly. And um, the acquisitions process, if you look at it, it's this archaic flow chart of boxes and arrows, and it's become its own meme in, in mm. circles. And, um, you know, when there's actually a hot conflict, it tends to be a forcing mechanism for getting rid of some of that regulation. So it's mm. of things that were probably well intended, but evolve over time and um and at a certain point need to be disrupted i mean i'd i'd agree entirely i mean look at like i like i mentioned before i think that the you know the the public private corporate labs like ibm labs and, and rca and and all these things that were very in you know very successful during the cold war you know maybe there are modern ways of of rebooting that similar idea with these calls for startups that you're that you're talking about um, you know, and in incubating them uh, in ways that are sort of better suited to the modern era and to the modern conflicts that we face, that would be, you know, sort of, that, that would yield a lot of, a lot of benefits. Um, but yeah, like, like you said, you know, a lot of times it, it takes something, uh, you know, some danger to, to focus efforts on improving things. And, you know, hopefully we'll get a little bit closer to that. Yeah. Um, the other thing I wonder is like, whether there's, um, like not enough competition in the military in the military industrial complex because there's been so much consolidation among the various uh you know big weapons producers 
um, and whether that sort of winds up being uh, a lack of competition uh, that you need for markets to really function well and to provide you uh, high quantities at low costs. Um, and I don't know, you know, I'm not enough of an expert on the defense sector to sort of say, what are the policies that you could take to induce more competition, whether it's changes to the contracting system or, or you know, or antitrust or, or whatever. I, I just I just don't know enough about the about the sector to sort of say exactly what that should look like. But I, I do wonder whether there's insufficient competition as well. Yeah, I, I think on, on that topic, there was a December 2023 article in the New York Times about that exact topic about VC going into defense, uh, uh, defense spending, and wondering whether you know today's Palantir and SpaceX will be tomorrow's you know General Dynamics and Raytheon. Um, so on that topic, uh, speaking of military, we'll, we'll we'll bring it back to to China here. Was one last question from me. So the um, yeah IMF data comparing the year two thousand to twenty twenty shows that China has become the largest trade partner for the majority of countries in the world. Yeah. What paths uh, do you think the U.S. should pursue policy-wise in order to counter this, in particular with regard to nearshoring and maintaining influence in our own backyard? Think of it sort of like a modern approach to the Monroe Doctrine, if you will. Yeah. So I think, I think, you know, China becoming the largest trading partner for so many countries is really, um, a symptom of uh, figuring out how to evade tariffs, right? Um, it's not that, you know, I think U.S. trade with China has gone down by very much and Mexico and trade with China has gone up by very much. I think that it's uh, Chinese origin components being given a, a glossy finishing in Mexico um, and then being imported into the U.S. as a means of as a means of avoiding tariffs uh, on China. Um, the U.S. is sort of still the world's and source of consumer demand that hasn't changed, um, and I think that you know, sort of cracking down on that, you know, sort of is an you know is is an imperative is a national security imperative, right? Like if you if you want to try and separate yourself from China because you may be fighting a hot war with them and you, you cannot trust that uh, critical components into your military supply chain originate in China doesn't matter whether they come directly from China to the U.S. or whether they uh, go China, Mexico, U.S. Um, you still, if you still, if you need, you know, if if building your weapons and your defenses require those components and China says you're not getting them, it doesn't matter, you know, how many stops they make on the route if the ultimate origin is in China. So, so I do think, uh, you know, sort of cracking down on that is, is, a, is, a, is a, you know, is, is a policy necessity. Um, Got it. Thank you. Yael, turning it back to you. Thanks, Daniel. Those are great questions. Um, this